Well, it's, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to, to welcome you to the fourth round table on the ethics uh, of genome editing on the, on the theme of equal access and, and governance. Uh, this, this event is very special to us because it will conclude the series of uh, round tables on these topics that were initiated uh, in 2018 by UNESCO. And it will address important aspects of inclusiveness and regulatory issues and how we can build together um, effective policies through common ethical commitments in this field. I, I wish to thank the uh, government of Japan for their support on all these roundtables. I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, we have Mr. Taguchi with us, the Secretary General of the National Commission of UNESCO in Japan. And so please convey our appreciation to, to your government. But I also want to thank uh, our dear chair of the International Bioethics Committee, former chair, but uh, always present and always uh, contributing. Um, uh, and, and thank you for being here, Herbe Schneiweiss. And, um, and the experts that are joining us, uh, Mrs. Francoise uh, Bailey is a philosopher and university researcher professor from Canada, welcome. Uh, Idenori Akutsu, a specialized in reproductive and stem cell research from Japan. Great to have you. And, and Martina Crispo from Uruguay, who is uh, working on the genome editing uh, on animals. So great, uh, great to have you all. Um, and as I said, uh, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology of the Japanese uh, government, uh, who has been really supportive in, in UNESCO advancing its uh, leadership role in this in this discussion. Through the work of uh, our two ethics consultative uh, bodies, namely the International Bioethics Committee and the World Commission of Ethics and Scientific Knowledge, we are constantly keeping the pace with the rapid scientific advancements addressing numerous ethical implications of frontier technologies will result in adoption of three standard setting instruments in the field of bioethics. As we witness today, the scientific uh, triumph of rapidly developed and effective mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, it's very interesting because they were so rapidly uh, developed, but at the same time, they raised a lot of distrust and concerns. Uh, so on the one hand, we celebrate science, and on the other hand, uh, we don't trust it. Uh, the same for the very recent case of genetically modified uh, pig's heart transplanted into a human, uh, which raises a lot of hopes, but again, lots of ethical uh, considerations that are even uh, personal. Genome editing techniques are being able to treat, to treat some genetic diseases, uh, a certain type of blindness, for example, uh, beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia are, are really becoming a reality, promising. And according to the WHO, approximately 5% of the world population carries straight gene genes for hemoglobin disorders, mainly sickle cell disease and thalassemia, and over 300,000 babies with severe hemoglobin disorders are born each year. So the magnitude and the possibility of, of, of these promising technologies is just, is just huge. Uh, but however, the current cost of genome editing technologies is only affordable for a limited number of people, mostly in the global north. Uh, treating sickle cell disease with genome editing today costs about $2 million uh, per patient. It's just, I, I would say it's just not available. Uh, because who's gonna pay for it? Uh, or, or is it gonna be only available for those that can be the very, very lucky few that can uh, pay for it? And that's why this discussion on governance and ensuring fair and equitable access to genome editing, it's really an urgent matter. Uh, the gene drive technology, that is another way of applying genome editing such uh, in cases such as malaria and reducing invasive species and saving endangered species, but malaria still infects huge proportion of populations. Uh, in 2020, it reached about 241 million cases worldwide, while the estimated number of that uh, stood at 627,000. Uh, and therefore, again, uh, very promising, but we need, for example, the Gates Foundation to, to invest uh, 75 million in research for the Imperial College of London to advance this discussion. So again, it's it's really a, a matter of how much we can invest and who can invest 
and how do we make uh, the findings uh, available to everybody. Gene the drive risk to, uh, is also causing unprecedented impact on the environment and biodiversity if not regulated properly. Um, and therefore, UNESCO is happy to host these global uh, dialogues. Uh, the patent issue has also emerged in consideration uh, regarding equitable access to technology. The US patent and trademark offers alone have around 6,000 patents related to CRISP or patents applications with 200 being added every month, uh, mostly from China and the US. But, but again, as with many of the emerging technologies, we just got the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And we know that uh, patents are completely, completely um, uh, skewed towards certain uh, countries, certain universities, certain uh, researchers. And therefore, again, this governance is, is really very, very important. So there are many things that we would love to hear from you. Uh, we would love to uh, learn from you. And again, uh, thanking the Japanese government uh, for having given us the opportunity to organize these roundtables. And therefore, I want to uh, give the floor to Mr. Yasushi Taguchi, who, as I said, is the Secretary General of the National Commission for UNESCO. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Assistant Director General, uh, Madam Ramos. Uh, Professor Schneibas, former chair of the International Bioethics Committee, honorable speakers, and distinguished guests. Today, on behalf of the government of Japan, it is a great honor and a privilege for me to have been given this opportunity to say a few words on the occasion of the fourth roundtable on ethics of genome editing on the theme of uh, equal access and governance. While the rapid development of, the li of life sciences in recent years has contributed enormously to the improvement of human welfare, uh, the accompanying uh, bioethical issues, such as those related human dignity and human rights, have a huge impact on the everyday social issues in our immediate environment and indeed on our very existence. In light of the spread of COVID-19 in recent years and its countermeasures, a bioethical perspectives are indispensable, for, for example, in the development of vaccines and uh, therapeutic agents. This is an issue we are facing right now. And it is important that not only researchers, but all of us recognize it to be a common issue for all of us and reflect it in our actions toward equal access. The aim of the roundtable series is to hopefully help you gain a better understanding of the potential benefits and risks of new developments in science and technology and the resulting uh, <clears throat> social transformation so that the progress in science and technology is in line with the values that have been formed to date. And with this in mind, we have held three roundtables on the ethics of genome editing thus far. Regarding the roundtables held in the past, videos of the roundtable have been categorized by theme and uh, released for public viewing to the world. And I have been uh, delighted to hear that they are highly evaluated, which makes me very proud as a donor of this roundtable. Uh, this uh, culmination of our past work has resulted in the setting of the theme, focus on the future of humanity and how people should, should live with new technologies. Based on UNESCO's efforts so far, I hope that interdisciplinary dialogues will further uh, discussions on the relationship between science, science and technology and human society from a more cross disciplinary perspective. But last uh, but not 
uh, last but not least, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to Assistant Director General Ramos and the staff at the UNESCO Secretariat uh, who have been uh, instrumental in the preparation for hosting this roundtable series and our honorable speakers uh, whom we look forward to hearing from. In closing, uh, please allow me to express my hope that this roundtable will be further enriched and that interest in ethics of genome editing will increase even further, allowing even more in-depth discussions to take place. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Taguchi, and, uh, and thanks again to, for Japan's support for this very important uh, um, series of, uh, of roundtables. Let me now give the floor to our moderator, and uh, as I said, uh, uh, Mr. Snipeis, who was the former chair of the International Bioethics Committee, not only the former chair, I, I think he really pushed the envelope and put the, the committee in, in very solid grounds. Uh, he is the uh, professor and director of the Research Center on, on Neurosciences in Parisian IVPS. Uh, and has many distinguished, uh, I, I just attended recently his decoration by Legion Le d'Honneur, so we will take a little too long to put her uh, CV on, in front of you. So I'd rather pass the floor to him to continue the proceedings. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gabriela, and thank you so much for the Japanese government for this uh, support for this roundtable. Uh, je vais passer en, en français pour vous rappeler euh, d'abord qu'est-ce que c'est l'édition du génome. Quand on parle d'édition du génome, on parle d'une modification ciblée du génome. Il s'agit de changer une ou plusieurs bases euh, au génome afin de modifier l'expression d'un gène, en général éteindre cette expression ou corriger euh, une mutation, nous y reviendrons. Pourquoi l'UNESCO s'intéresse à cette question, eh bien, je dirais que c'est associé au développement de la bioéthique à l'UNESCO, puisque vous vous souvenez que c'est dans le contexte des travaux sur le génome humain que la première déclaration universelle, la déclaration universelle sur le génome humain et les droits de l'homme, a été publiée dès 1997 et endossée par les Nations unies l'année suivante. C'est la fameuse euh, déclaration universelle qui considère d'une façon symbolique le génome humain comme un patrimoine universel. Plus tard, l'UNESCO et son comité international de bioéthique sont revenus sur les questions de génétique avec la déclaration universelle sur la génétique et les droits de l'homme et bien sûr au sein de la déclaration universelle sur la bioéthique et les droits de l'homme, euh, le génome euh, tient euh, une place importante. Dès 2015, quand nous avons publié euh, le, la mise à jour de nos recommandations euh, sur le génome, le Comité international de bioéthique a souligné l'importance de l'avancée scientifique et de l'impact potentiel de l'édition du génome, indiquant d'ailleurs très clairement, dès les conclusions de 2015, que compte tenu des incertitudes et du manque de maîtrise de la technique, nous devions avancer rapidement dans l'édition du génome somatique, mais interdire l'édition du génome à but transmissible, héritable. C'est quelque chose que vous retrouverez dans le rapport du CIB de 2015. Dès le 24 septembre 2018, nous avons commencé la première table ronde et vous vous souvenez probablement tous que c'était à l'occasion du 25e anniversaire du Comité international de bioéthique et c'était aussi le 20e anniversaire du CIGB et de la Comest. Cette table ronde était intitulée « Édition du génome, pourquoi l'éthique compte ?» Et nous avions déjà des invités prestigieux avec Pete Mill euh, du Neufield Council, euh, Jennifer Merchant et, et Karine Giovanangeli, des spécialistes euh, sur le plan légal 
ou sur le plan biologique de l'édition du génome. Nous avons poursuivi ces tables rondes en décembre 2019 avec la seconde table ronde qui, elle, portait sur l'impact du génome humain sur la santé et sur l'environnement, avec de nouveau des invités prestigieux des quatre coins du monde, Sarah Chan de l'Université d'Édimbourg, Kachuto Kato de l'Université de Kyoto, Francine Toumi de la République du Congo, Nicolas Rode de France. Nous avons poursuivi les travaux malgré la pandémie de Covid avec la troisième table ronde sur l'édition du génome qui, elle, portait sur l'engagement du public, sur l'inclusion du public. Et nous avions différents participants, Sonia Pemberton, une productrice de films multiprimés, Kevin Esfeldt pour le gene drive, le forçage génétique, et Tessie Hachan comme représentante du Conseil de l'Europe. Nous avons vu à travers ces trois tables rondes, dont vous pourrez retrouver sur le site de l'UNESCO les différents résultats, des aspects éthiques, des aspects d'impact sur la santé, des aspects d'impact sur l'environnement, et nous avons discuté comment est-ce que cela nous concerne tous, comme l'a rappelé notre directrice générale, l'impact sur la santé, l'accès aux soins, mais plus encore, la conception que nous avons nous-mêmes en tant qu'individus et dans le concept One Health, la conception que nous avons aussi de la nature. Aujourd'hui, nous voulons terminer cette série par le fait qu'il n'y a pas d'avancée scientifique sans un partage de cette avancée scientifique. C'est l'article 15 de notre déclaration sur la bioéthique, le partage des bénéfices. Quel sens pour les droits de l'homme, quel sens pour la communauté internationale, d'un progrès réservé à quelques-uns, voire même qui permettrait à quelques-uns d'acquérir une puissance supplémentaire sur d'autres. Nous avons vu à travers la crise du Covid que les inégalités de santé étaient d'abord dirigées, conduites par des inégalités sociales et que la manière dont notre monde doit s'organiser doit inclure les technologies émergentes, c'est vrai pour l'ARN messager, pour les vaccins anti-Covid, c'est vrai pour l'édition du génome, et Gabriela Ramos a cité le cas de la drépanocytose, maladie très fréquente en Afrique et dans des pays où des populations afro, afro, d'origine africaine ont été déportés, puis se sont installés. Nous allons voir donc aujourd'hui, avec nos trois invités prestigieux, différents aspects de la possibilité d'accéder à ces technologies. Dans un premier temps, Françoise Baylis, une des spécialistes mondiales de la sociologie associée aux questions de bioéthique dans le domaine de l'édition du génome, va nous présenter ses considérations. Françoise Baylis est professeure de recherche à l'Université de Dalhousie, au Canada. Elle, est, elle a reçu pour ses travaux très importants de prestigieuses récompenses, en particulier l'Ordre du Canada. Françoise Baylis est une spécialiste reconnue euh, et elle a, par exemple, fait partie du groupe d'experts de l'OMS euh, qui ont rendu en juillet 2021 euh, des conclusions sur euh, un guide global de gouvernance euh, responsable de l'édition du génome euh, chez l'homme. Nous aurons ensuite euh, l'opportunité d'écouter euh, le docteur Idenori Akutsu, Victor Idenori Akutsu est le directeur du département de médecine reproductive au Centre national pour l'enfant et le développement de la santé à Tokyo. Et c'est un spécialiste de l'application biologique de ces techniques. Enfin, nous aurons la chance d'écouter Martina Crispo, 
euh, de euh, l'Institut Pasteur de Montevideo en Uruguay, qui, euh, avec son équipe, euh, mm -hmm. a été parmi les premières à développer euh, l'application des techniques d'édition du génome chez l'animal, et en particulier l'animal d'élevage, les ovins ou les bovins, euh, afin d'étudier des possibilités de rendre euh, l'élevage euh, animal euh, plus efficace pour pouvoir nourrir le monde. Et donc, sans plus de délai, je vais passer la parole euh, au professeur Françoise Baylis, que je remercie une fois de plus euh, d'avoir accepté euh, de participer à cette table ronde. Françoise, à toi la parole. Thank you very much for that uh, welcome introduction and also for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts and ideas uh, with respect to a very, very important topic, which is equal access and governance uh, of human genome editing. The presentation today will in part reflect on some recent work that you've already heard mention of, which is the report that was issued by the World Health Organization earlier this year. Actually, no, I guess we're into the new year 2022, so in July of 2021. As well, uh, some of my thoughts will be informed by my own uh, academic research in this area. So I want to start by saying something that's very obvious in one sense, but I think it's always a good starting place, which is that we live in a world that is socially, culturally, and politically diverse. We have independent countries with their own systems of governance, their own rules, regulations, guidelines, laws, and most countries have a very keen interest in guarding their independence. At the same time, we know that science is a global enterprise. And as you've already heard, we all, not just the scientific community, have a shared interest in the direction of frontier science. We have an interest in this partly because especially in this area of science, we're thinking about the future of humanity. What are the implications of what it is that we're trying to do? And in a more proximate way, we're also very concerned about the health implications of some of these new technologies. So for these and other reasons, governance is a very important and challenging topic. And from my perspective, governance doesn't start with the rules and regulations. It actually starts with the ethical values that underpin these rules and regulations. And what you see in the slide is an excerpt from the governance report that was published by the WHO. And you see values and principles divided into two broad categories. The first are what in an academic context we would refer to as procedural values, and the second are the substantive values. And I just want to draw your attention to a couple of the substantive values that I think overlap directly with the theme of this fourth round table, which is equal access. And that's looking at issues like inclusiveness, fairness, social justice, non-discrimination, solidarity. I think what you can see here very clearly is that this was a committee that really embraced the importance of not developing science for the few, but ensuring that any potential benefits from the science would be available to all. And here I want to offer a couple of perspectives. I think this means that from a researcher's perspective, there's an interest in co-research opportunities. This research should not only be happening in a few discrete high-income countries, because that then means that the direction of the research is controlled by those interests. When we think about equal access, we also need to think about it from future patients' perspectives. And there is empirical research that says very clearly that patients want meaningful, meaningful engagement as trials are designed and approved. Patients around the world want the opportunity to participate in clinical trials, and most importantly, they want access to the long-term benefits of such research. And so they don't have an interest, for example, in only being a trial participant, 
and they and their community never having access to downstream benefits because of things like excessive cost. And lastly, society has an interest in how we think about which values and principles are important, largely because society wants to have a say when we're talking about things like the future of humanity. And I will remind you that almost all high-level international professional organizations, as well as quasi-governmental organizations, have insisted on the importance of ongoing societal dialogue. And I think that's really important. If I can have the second slide. One of the things that's important to appreciate is that these values are what I hope undergird what we understand to be the more formal mechanisms of governance. And again, here you have an excerpt from the WHO report listing some of the tools, institutions, processes that can be used for governance. And as an aside, I would commend to you the concept of governance as it's defined by UNESCO. And this is in fact available on the website. And it makes this point very clearly that we have both these kinds of formal mechanisms, but that norms and values are also a very important part of the concept of governance. I won't take you through each of these. Um, I do invite you to read the report, but what I would like to do is to emphasize one particular tool which is research ethics guidelines and research ethics review. And I think here what's really important to appreciate is that this is a particular moment in time, because as you've heard, we're starting to move into clinical trials. And that means that governance of those clinical trials is important. And a number of people, myself included, but it also makes its way into the WHO report, believe that such research should not take place in countries that do not have adequate governance. Now, that doesn't mean that any country is barred from participating. It just means they need to do the policy work, the governance work to make sure that they're protecting and promoting the interests of their citizens. Lastly, I'd like to end my remarks with the next slide, please, which speaks very specifically to something that I am deeply committed to, which is public education, public engagement, public empowerment. I think this is absolutely key to the overarching theme of equal access and good governance. And the important thing to appreciate here is I don't think this is controversial. It's very important that the general public have access to information and to tools such that they can anticipate what's happening and participate in discussion. In terms of public engagement, it's important to appreciate that there's a conversation that needs to happen in two directions, that there's knowledge that rests with communities, just as there's knowledge that rests with science. And lastly, there's the point about public empowerment. And this is what I referred to when I said that patient communities have said very clearly they want meaningful engagement in terms of trial design and the approval of trials that are going to go forward. So I'd like to end my opening remarks there, and I want to come back to a number of these themes in the conversation that will follow. But I just want to remind you of what I said at the outset, that while there's independent goals and values that discrete countries may have, science is a global enterprise, and we want it to become a global public good, which means equal access for all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, for Francoise, for this uh, brilliant and uh, so straight to the point uh, introduction to our roundtable. Uh, Idenori, uh, could you follow now with your okay. preliminary um, words? So, okay, I try to upload my slides. Uh, I take uh, this uh, opportunity to mention that uh, anyone in the public, and you are already more than 250, you can uh, use the Q and Air uh, box button at the uh, bottom of your uh, screen to ask questions 
uh, general question or specific question to one of our, of our speaker. Eden or can you, the floor is Can you here. see my slides? Yes. yes. Okay. Full screen. Thank you for patient. So uh, uh, first of all, um, I really appreciate uh, uh, having me here. And uh, thank you for Professor Schneibas for uh, organizing this round table. And uh, I ap greatly appreciate um, uh, people in the UNESCO for uh, preparing and hosting these uh, opportunities. So I want to share with uh, about a regulatory issue and the individual uh, countries, also um, uh, the, the, the scientific issue about uh, genome editing on human embryo. So uh, uh, my uh, present about regulatory action for genome editing uh, technology on human uh, embryos in Japan. So in my five, uh, the first slides, I want to share with a uh, concept, uh, cells and embryo development. So this is very simple, but uh, very important for further uh, discussion. Yeah. So sperm and oocyte fertilized uh, to become a, a zygote. This one cell, cell uh, one cell embryo, finally can become to a whole body and the placenta. This is basic, but a huge important concept. So there are two major categories in human bodies, somatic cell and the germ cells. When we consider clinical action such as a gene therapy uh, for somatic cells. So generally, we have a good regulation and uh, regulatory support uh, existed. However, today we focus about uh, germ cell, germline cells. So germline cells that can be passed on to the next generation. That's a very important concept and a huge difference from somatic cells. So um, potentially germ cells can be used to, uh, I mean potentially, uh, germ cells uh, can be used to basic research and reproductive purpose. So, when we consider SQL guidelines for research using uh, genome editing on human embryo, this basic concept is uh, very important for, for us. So taking an example, uh, our country in Japan. So uh, expert panel on bioethics of Japan uh, have uh, uh, started discussion on building ethical guideline for research using uh, gene editing on human embryo since 2015. This, that 2015, that year, uh, was uh, a researcher in China uh, had published the first report using, gene, uh, using human embryo with uh, genome editing. So since then, the expert panel of Japan that they heavily uh, started discussion on ethical guideline for uh, the using gene editing on human embryo. Then uh, since uh, nearly four years, we uh, took nearly four years, the finally the guideline was released at 2019. This guideline for research, only research uh, purpose using genome editing on human embryo. This, in, uh, this guideline having uh, three major issues. 
Uh, first is uh, no clinical use, of course, no clinical use for germline editing on human embryo. And uh, second, the research purpose is very limited. We uh, limited the type of the research purpose. For instance, uh, the, the researcher in Japan can be used gene editing for human embryo. However, uh, only for both understanding function of gene in early development and understanding hereditary diseases. And also the third, this one is ESCAL guidelines. ESCAL guideline is cannot uh, prevent the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, it's a it's a wrong way using this technology. SKL guideline is similar. Japanese this SKL guideline is similar to soft law. Soft law is a uh, uh, not law, but uh, have uh, some sanctions. For instance, researcher have uh, if we violate them are required to repay research fund they received. So. Uh, considering this ethical guideline for research purpose and the germline editing, uh, germline cells editing uh, for uh, 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 human, uh, human embryo, this is very, uh, uh, we have uh, some problem in this situation in Japan because germline editing very close to reproductive medicine. So currently, we do not have a, a critical regulation to prevent. So uh, like a uh, gene editing uh, baby. So, so far, we now, uh, the, we now uh, seeking for a uh, building a new regulation to prevent the, 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 the reproductive purpose uh, jam to, for instance, uh, gene uh, germline editing designer babies. So, so that's why uh, I think uh, uh, the each country has uh, considered that some regulation, uh, the regulation is important. However, we have to think about the global conditions because human and uh, this technology is mobile. It can sort of a borderless. So, so far, two major uh, the, the organization, WHO and the International uh, Commission uh, have published, uh, reported very important uh, uh, report. So this, based on this concept, we have to next step uh, the further. Uh, this is my, uh, this is last slide. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Idenori, for uh, this uh, overview of uh, the situation in Japan and also opening on the International Commission in addition to WHO Committee. And now we are moving to uh, Dr. Crispo, uh, moving from uh, human consideration to animal consideration, but we also need to feed the world and uh, what kind of impact and what kind of equal access uh, we can have in this field. Martina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hervé, and, and good morning, everybody. I'm here in South America. And thank you for the invitation to participate in this great round table. So I have a few slides just to tell you and show you some examples about what we do and the rest of some teams do also. So I'm going to, to share the screen. I hope you can see it here. So I mostly work uh, in the genome editing of uh, animals. We work with mice, but we also have generated some 
farm animals with this great technology. So I'm going to tell you how these applications can, can be uh, improved and enhance the, the world. So just to start, this is, um, let me see if this works, okay. This is to show you the different applications of this technology. Uh, mostly CRISPR. Uh, we, we, you can apply that uh, to increase productivity in farm animals, improve meat, milk, or hair, hair production. You can also apply this to enhance animal welfare, something that is very well appreciated. Uh, you can also apply this technology. And this, this application has been already demonstrated to improve animal health and disease resistance, to, to generate uh, disease resistant animals. You know, there are many diseases that kills lots of animals and uh, farm animals in the world. So this technology can be very well applied to this. Of course, for disease vector control, as Gabriela already mentioned before, this uh, gene drive technology can is being applied, uh, for example, in mosquitoes to suppress vector population. We are uh, here in our region and in our country, there are some projects that are developing this technology to control some pests like uh, flies, like some flies that can produce huge losses uh, in animal production. And of course, uh, gene drive can be applied to to control invasive species like wild, like wild porks here in, in our region is very common. And there are many other applications that can be used. And we say, always say that the limit is our imagination. So let me tell you about a few examples of this technology. This is uh, one of our, of our first models. Uh, after the, the technology of CRISPR has been published in 2013, we have generated some lamps here and uh, using CRISPR. And in, the, in this case, we have mutated a protein that is called myostatin. Myostatin is a protein that inhibits, inhibits uh, the muscle growth. So when we silence this protein, the, the muscle of the animal start to grow more and more. And we have produced uh, ships with a, an increase in 25% of body weight. So this is very interesting because you can have uh, in the same animal uh, more meat production. For example, this is a, a wild type lamb at 30 days old. So you can see here is a, is a normal lamb, and this is a mutant lamb, a knockout lamb for myostatin. And you can see here uh, in the back there is more meat production, and so we can we can use these uh, animals to increase the production in the same uh, area of land. So we don't have to increase the the land. So and we can. Uh, as service said, feed more the world. This is one of the intentions of these animals. Another example that we, ha we have generated here is a deaf lamb, deaf sheep. And in this case is uh, applied to bio biomedicine. Since the sheep, is, it has a similar size than humans. Then the idea with this sheep is to test different therapies in the ear of, uh, of the lambs. We have mutated this, this lamb. We have generated the same mutation than in humans using CRISPR, using a point mutation. So then uh, different therapies uh, can be tested and try to recover the, the hearing of these animals. Also, another report uh, from uh, other parts of the world that can be very useful uh, in that sense are, for example, this, uh, this cattle, dairy cattle that has been generated, that they are hornless. That means uh, in, in dairy cattle production, you need to, to um, take out the horns of this, of this cattle to, to be more, more productive. So in this case, they have generated a knocking 
animal where they they born without horns. So it's uh, is this is regarding the animal welfare. So animals won't have to be dehorned, and this is some, sometimes very painful for the animals. Also, another another example, for example, for from the Roslin Institute. The more recent, uh, they have generated pigs when that they lack uh, a receptor for a, for virus, so the porcine rep reproductive and respiratory virus infection. So this is a very problematic disease that kills thousands uh, of, of pigs every year. So with this kind of pigs, you can raise these pigs and you won't have the problem of this disease anymore. So again, these are some very good examples of what can we do to enhance the production of animals and improve the animal welfare and try to, to enhance uh, every time the, the animal production. This is more recent, this is from last week. Uh, maybe you, you have already heard about that. Uh, the first pig to human heart transplant uh, that had, has been made in a patient that was um, very sick and he couldn't receive a, a human heart. So they decided to use the, the heart from these genetically modified pigs that had been approved before by the FDA to use it as organ donors for, for humans. Okay, and in this case, uh, the pig has been modified. They, they don't express uh, some kind of sugar that makes the rejection of the organs. And the, the patient survived the first days. We don't know now what happened with them because that with him, because that happened, I think 10 days ago, but at least for a week, the, the patient survived. So this is a very, breakthrough approach of the, the technology. If we can supply these organs to the humans, you know, there is a big shortage, shortage of organs uh, worldwide. So this can be a very, very good use of the technology. And just to finish, let me tell you about the, the regulation of this technology. This is a review from 2020, but it's mostly in crops, but it's very similar for animals also. And you can see here uh, in traffic uh, lights and um, how the, the regulation is done uh, throughout the world. So you can see in green, for example, in, in the Americas, Canada and uh, South America, some countries from South America, uh, genome editing is not regulated as, as GMOs, also in Australia. Then you can see uh, some countries in yellow, okay, where the discussion is ongoing. For example, in my country, Uruguay, we are discussing how to regulate this technology, but we are mostly turning green very soon, I hope. And then you have in red Europe, in some countries from Europe, except UK, that they, they consider all the genome editing events as GMOs, something that can prevent using this technology and spreading this technology in, in this region. This is more recent, this is for, for animals. Um, and it's very similar because you can see in green, the countries uh, with, regulatory policy policy with exclusions. And this means they, they will accept all the genome edited events in animals uh, as regular animals and not as GMOs. And then again, some countries that are discussing and uh, Europe, uh, they, they don't accept genome editing events as as regular events, so they, they still try to, to govern this as GMOs. So I think, uh, yes, this is my slide, last slide. We have to, the technology is now here. As you can see, we can apply this very, very easily. Now it's time to discuss uh, how to regulate and how to make it available to everybody because it is very useful if we use it well. So thank you.
And thank you, Martina, for this uh, overview. And uh, uh, I'd like to jump in on your uh, presentation of this uh, breakthrough uh, last week of uh, a peak to, uh, to human uh, heart transplantation, maybe to, to challenge uh, the three of you on the necessity of uh, rapidly uh, evolving uh, regulations. Um, Francoise, to return to you, uh, how do you see the evolution of clinical trials and the question of first in humans uh, with this uh, new universe of uh, genome editing? Well, I think that the research that was reported last week, um, while for some it represents tremendous hope, I think for others it raises tremendous concerns. And I think the concerns are in a variety of domains. So, you know, one set of concerns will have to do with the actual experiment and the person who participated. And I think there's some reasonable questions to be asked in the context of uh, the candidate. The participant was not a candidate for a regular human heart. So that tells you something about the level of health that the person had. And so there's a question then of what it means to participate in a clinical trial for the sole purpose of knowledge production. And I say that because at the time, there was a lot of media coverage talking about this as a new lease on life. Um, I don't think that was true or accurate for this particular research participant. But I think what it does is it really raises a, a much more significant question, if you will, than what happened at the level of the, that interaction and consent and understanding and trial design and research review. It really asks us uh, a question about the future of the world in terms of our relationship with non-human animals. And I think that that's something that is becoming of increasing concern, whether we think that uh, all non-human animals are just there for our benefit. And so the challenge then becomes solely a technical one. Can we do this safely and effectively? And I do think a number of constituents, myself included, are asking questions about the direction of the science. And I'll say this in uh, a way that may be controversial for some, which is that I do think that there is some uh, importance and value in accepting our mortality, and that in some contexts, the drive to win at all costs or to live at all costs, including swapping a human life for a non-human life, does need to be called into question. I want to be clear, I'm not calling into question the practices that we currently have in place with respect to the use of non-human animals for research. I do think that we could do better in terms of that regulation. But for my own part, that's where some of my work goes and my thinking goes, especially in the context of One Health, we do need to start interrogating our assumption that we are the only species um, that should dominate. Uh, thank you, Francoise. Idenori, uh, for the best of my knowledge, Japan uh, since uh, 2017 was very innovative uh, for uh, opening new treatments uh, rapidly from clinical trials or preliminary uh, to a human use. Uh, how do you see this uh, first uh, in human uh, peak to human uh, heart transplantation? Yes, uh, so, so, so far, uh, no clinical trial using animal uh, organ transplantation, but uh, the basic, as a basic research, so animal human chimera experiment is uh, very advancing in, in our countries. So that's why uh, the, the final goal is the same, I think same. So that's why we uh, very, uh, um, uh, this uh, achievement is uh, 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 very uh, important for us to, to consider for our the, this basic research for further uh, uh, advancement. So this time peak uh, heart organ transplantation, I think uh, have uh, two major uh, issues. One is uh, uh, the organ transplantation from gym editing animal, uh, uh, animals, and also the heart, a uh, pig heart transplanted. 
So this is human, uh, first human trial. So that's why, of course, we think about the uh, safety ness and uh, maybe efficacy. So this case is a risk versus benefit or risk versus risk. So the, we, uh, uh, we take this experiment more uh, cautiously and uh, also, uh, um, yeah. Uh, so uh, also uh, the people in society uh, they what uh, I, I also uh, curious about uh, people and the society uh, what they think about this achievement. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Indenori. Just for our general audience to 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 uh, make them understanding why we are speaking of this. Uh, regulation uh, in both case uh, pig to to human uh, transplantation or uh, animal uh, to human chimeras we need the genome editing in one case uh, the pig that was used was genome edited not only for one gene but for 10 genes to try to prevent rejection of the organ uh, and also to try uh, to, uh, to to ease uh, the adoption of the organ by the human um, immune system. In the case of chimera, the idea is to uh, remove a gene from the animal, to knock down, for example, a gene uh, that is involved in the development of the pancreas, uh, and then to uh, inject uh, human stem cells and hope they will make a pancreas in the pig, uh, in this example. And uh, if uh, doing so, uh, we can have or human organs or humanized organs for transplantation. So uh, this is a typical case where we, we absolutely need uh, public engagement, as uh, Francoise showed in one of the, of the case, education to try to understand what we are doing, uh, engagement to discuss this kind of views, and empowerment to decide what kind of use, uh, with this balance of uh, uh, safety and efficacy in humans and um, acceptability uh, for animals uh, to, to use them in this way. Uh, how do you Hervé, see that? Can I jump, yes. Sorry, Hervé, can I just jump in for a minute? Yes, um, yes. I think course. one of the things I'd like to add specifically with, this, with respect to this case scenario is the emphasis on one of the themes for the session, which is equal access. So we saw a slide about governments showing how different countries do or don't regulate um, the genetic modification of animals as GMOs or uh, other. And one of the countries is Canada. So for example, we have genetically modified salmon, we have genetically modified canola, we have a number of food products that have been genetically modified. And I think one of the things there is at least in principle, you can begin to see how there could be um, this kind of work consistent with the goal of equal access, equal access to food and trying to address issues of food insecurity around the world. I think with this particular recent experiment, and I think it's important to say in ethics, we've been talking about xenotransplantation for a long time. And in science, this work has been going on for a long time but it's now really entering the public domain. So as you say, a good opportunity for public education, engagement and empowerment. But this would be an example of science where I really worry it's a very narrow kind of personalized medicine that would only ever be available in very extreme cases for a very small minority. And so I think it's the kind of science that's worth thinking about in terms of where as a society do we want to invest our time, our talent, our money? Because in some sense, those are all finite resources. And so we have to, we have to make some decisions about what we think is important in terms of achieving equal access to the benefits of science. Obviously, obviously, Martina, uh, maybe some more on uh, some aspect because we, with this uh, transplantation, we are, as uh, Francois just said, in limited uh, number of cases, but also uh, in uh, uh, 
a, a kind of medicine which is a cure. Uh, maybe working on uh, modified food, we could prevent some aspect. Uh, I know that some modified oil uh, were made after genome editing to have a better balance of omega-3 or omega-6. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the kind of uh, meat you can obtain from these transgenic animals? Uh, does the quality, quality of life of animals and quality of the food is also at stake with these genome editing techniques? Yes, we, we have to consider all the things when we generate these animals. Um, the health, the well-being of the animals is very important, of course. So, of, for example, when we make these, these models, we always uh, have some comparisons with wild-type animals and we can, uh, during the, the time, we can follow them and see if they have some health issues. There have been reports of other models that, that have been uh, produced and that have presented some health issues and this is something we have to take into into account but we have to improve the the technology we have to continue because it's, it's very very worth worthful to for for everybody and we have to listen as Francois says to everybody that will be involved the stakeholders on the government who will regulate the general public the activists everybody because uh, we are not the owners of the of the animals or the technology so everything has to be taken into account uh, but we don't we cannot stop because, uh, as I said before, it's worthy to, to use this technology for the well-being of, of the world. But if we can continue on this way, on your maps, many countries were in white. So meaning no regulation or so difficult to find that you, you, you had no color. Mm -hmm. On, on these countries. Yes. So what uh, international bodies such as uh, UNESCO uh, could do to, uh, um, in, uh, in cooperation with others like WHO if it's uh, human health, but what could we do to um, implement the second slide of uh, Francoise uh, on the tools of governance to, to make these countries not only wild countries, but uh, governed countries? Well, may maybe the white countries are somehow just starting with the technology, just discussing, or they don't have the capacities. And we have to try to, to spread this, this technology and try to, to reach everybody. There are some initiatives like uh, ARIG, maybe the Association for Responsible Research for Genome Editing, or, and this can be useful because there, there, there are members from every part of the world. So these kind of associations can be can be good to spread the, the world and try. I think it, it will be difficult to, to consensuate it with everybody how to work with this, but at least we have to spread the words and try to involve everybody, uh, all the countries and, and let them hear about this and how can them regulate this for, for their well-being. Um, maybe we can, uh, we can return to uh... Idenori, because uh, you have shown us uh, that Japan was doing a lot of efforts for new regulations. Uh, how you, could you see uh, the combination of innovation and uh, the promotion of innovation and uh, good governance? Uh, could you, could you yeah. say uh, yes. more about the dynamic in Japan? Yes, so uh, actually, uh, this technology, gene, genomic uh, gene editing, very important also, uh, important means uh, for uh, basic research and also clinical application in using somatic cells. So we, uh, the Japanese government, firstly uh, prepare the good research environment 
meant to building uh, several guidelines. So uniquely, Japan has uh, not only one guideline, this, uh, research ethical guideline, it's uh, at least six different guidelines when we use uh, human embryo, quite a uh, little bit complicated. But uh, finally, the, they uh, 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 published, uh, they prepared the research guideline, uh, ethical guideline. However, on the other hand, uh, the, some, if someone use this technology for um, intent, uh, uh, intended or something not nice use, uh, for instance, uh, such as uh, uh, designer baby uh, use. So in that case, currently, we do not have any regulation to prevent such a wrong case. So that's why I think uh, two important issues. The each country has preparing the, uh, the some guideline, also the regulation to uh, collect to use uh, new technologies. And also now the people and the technology is a, a borderless kind of. Uh, so that's why we think about, uh, uh, we really, uh, the global view to prevent or support the technology proceed the right way. That's uh, important, I think. Um, I see many questions in our um, Q&R uh, question. Uh, many questions are obviously about the safety of the process. Uh, people are wondering uh, how uh, all these new techniques uh, are submitted to uh, safety assessment. Uh, is it safe? Uh, because these, uh, these discussions, uh, is it or not GMO? It's clearly that all these or new organisms, whether it is crops or whether it is uh, animals, uh, are genetically engineered. Uh, classically, the definition of GMO was the introduction of a foreign gene in uh, a new organism. Here, there is no foreign gene. Uh, it's the modification of the genome of the plant or of the genome of animal. But uh, the question of assessment, of safety assessment remain uh, because we need to know if there is any kind of modification in another gene because we need to know if the modification is stable over time and because we need to know uh, if aside the beneficial aspects that we envisage, some detrimental uh, other aspect could appear. But uh, this is a classical assessment. I think that, Francoise, uh, you insisted on uh, more than uh, just technical assessment and more than safety. You insisted on ethical uh, values that should underlie the decision to uh, go uh, or not to go, and uh, how we could envisage uh, governance uh, ahead of safety. Right. Yes, yeah, so if I can, I'd actually like to just expand a little bit on Idinori's comments when he gave us information about the policy situation in Japan, stating that they have guidelines at this point, but not legislation. And what I'd like to do is to put that in a broader uh, global context. So what you have in front of you on this screen is an excerpt from a recent publication in the CRISPR journal with colleagues, uh, Katie Hasten, Marcy Darnovsky, and Timothy Cron. And what we did is we tried to look for what we call policy documents. So that's not just legislation, but it is things also like research ethics guidelines to try to get a better understanding of where the world is. I'm going to show you two slides. 
both of them have to do with the modification of the germline. And as you've heard, that's separate from making modifications to somatic cells. And making modifications to somatic cells would be about trying to develop therapies, whereas this, these um, manipulations or modifications would have to do with trying to have an impact on reproduction. Research is currently ongoing that is analogous to this in order to be able to provide that information for research happening with somatic cells. This particular slide documents as best we can, and it is a little bit out of date now, um, the situation from a policy perspective around the globe with respect to germline editing in the lab. So this is for basic research, not for clinical research. So there's no transfer of the modified human embryo into a human for the purpose of reproducing. And what you can see is that um, a number of countries, in fact, where we were able to find relevant documents, didn't have specific information on this issue. So on the slide, it shows that 96 countries had relevant documents and that most did not have content specific to germline editing. The most there is 56 out of the 96. We could not find relevant information on this topic in a document that was relevant. What's important is that there are 23 countries that even prohibit the work that happens in the lab. My country, Canada, is one of those countries. Of those 23, however, there are four countries that actually have some exceptions to the prohibition. There are only 11 countries that explicitly permit this research in the lab, and indeed Japan is one of those countries. The next slide, please. This next slide, as you can see immediately, is very different from the previous slide. And this is now looking at the modification of germline cells, but for the purpose of reproduction, where the goal is in fact to eventually permit the transfer of a genetically modified human embryo into a human. And in this case, what I think is explicitly important is that we were not able to find a single country that would actually explicitly endorse this as something that at this point in time would be seen as a reasonable policy option. Having said this, only 75 of the 96 places where we were able to find relevant documents included a prohibition, and five of those 75 actually included exceptions. So if you will, this is a brief aperçu of a global policy landscape, and as I said, it captures both guidelines and legislation. But with both of them, what you can see is a number of countries where we, at this point, haven't been able to get information and will continue to work to fill out the map. But having said all of that, everything is subject to change, and the change can go in either direction. Places that prohibit could choose eventually to permit. Places that permit could choose to prohibit or to constrain. So what becomes critically important as the science is continuing to advance is that we actually actively encourage and support public dialogue. Because I think it's really important, especially in the context of imagining an impact on the future of humanity, to have everyone involved. You can remove that slide now because I just want to end this little commentary with a, a personal observation, which is that I am among what I think are a few, uh, not many necessarily, that advocate not only for global dialogue, but also for trying to work towards what I call broad societal consensus. Many people are skeptical about whether or not this is possible, and I understand the skepticism because I said at the outset we live in a socially, culturally, and politically diverse world. And so I accept that my goal of consensus building may not be achieved, but wouldn't the world be a better place if we actually tried? And one of the things that I think then becomes important is that you can actually see global dialogue as advocated for by a number of people, including most of the vociferously civil society, as a form of governance. Because as that conversation is happening, you are in fact impacting what gets thought of as important to include in guidelines, to include in regulations. And in the theme of this session, one of those things is equal access to the benefits of research. I think as has already been said, we have seen very dramatically in the last couple of years with the pandemic, how uh, inequality um, has led to considerable uh, 
injustice. And we need to ensure that we don't continue to perpetuate that. Thank you. Thank you, Francoise, for, uh, for putting this in. And uh, it's extremely important to uh, follow up on your maps. Uh, and see how we can implement uh, the regulation and the governance, at least the tools of governance and the countries and the people will do uh, what they want, but at least to have some governance in the countries that are still in gray or in white uh, on your uh, map. Uh, but uh, this is also reminiscent of the fact that um, the question of governance is uh, multifactorial and that as soon as we discussed uh, in uh, 2015, uh, these questions of what field of use of uh, genome editing, we were uh, considering three aspects. One was the science, and it's clear that the uh, prohibition of uh, heritable, human heritable uh, modification is first derived by the fact that we know how to cut uh, with some other technique, we know how to modify certain bases, but we don't know what is happening then, uh, especially at the zygote time to take the first slide of uh, Idenori. So considering our ignorance, considering the amount of uncertainties from already the science point of view, this need to be prohibited. Then the second point that cannot be disconnected from the first one was what kind of medical condition, what field of application, and we can extend what kind of medical um, condition to what kind of uh, consideration for uh, feeding, or what kind of consideration uh, for the environment with consideration to the climate change. And finally, the third point that the third consideration that could not be disconnected from the first two one was public uh, debate, was societal discussions. And uh, we see the state of science. We need still to discuss what kind of conditions could need genome editing interventions. We absolutely need to feed this societal discussion and this societal debate. This is what we tried to do with uh, uh, our um, uh, round tables, but governance should be also uh, building facilities to help the society to debate this question and to decide uh, these three steps of education, uh, um, um, uh, engagement, and empowerment. So something which is already in the Oviedo Convention, Article 28 of the Oviedo Convention, but uh, very difficult to set up, very difficult to develop. Um, in, in the last uh, short round table, uh, Martina, could you tell us what kind of societal debate or discussion is organized or should be organized in Latin America? Yes, well, for at least for crops, there is a very well debate already organized in, in our country and in, in regional countries like, like Argentina and Brazil, where after the regulation of some kind of genetically modified crops, there, are, there is a social approach and debate and see, if they, they are against or pro, some, many times they are against the release of this kind of genetically modified crops. Yeah, for animals, uh, I know in, in Argentina and Brazil, they have good structures to debate with the society. And we are starting to do this in, in Uruguay because uh, as we are working hard in these technologies, we want to include everybody. We work in very close collaboration with the government uh, to try to regulate this before releasing or trying to release this to the, to the market. 
And uh, of course, we want to generate this public debate, mostly for the shin drive technologies, because uh, this can, can have a strong impact in the population. You can eradicate any pest population, and maybe if you eradicate, for example, rats, maybe another species can come and, and invade. So this is very, very important. And every time we, we have a project, we try to involve everybody to, to discuss. And I think this is the direction we, we have to move because uh, as scientists, we can do the best science, of course, but then this this should have an application. If not, it's, it's not very interested, interesting. So, so yes, we have to have a, a big consensus and inform, inform everybody all, all the time, as simple as we can inform how is the technology, the risk of the technologies. Uh, we don't have all, all the answers, of course, but at least we have to be there to, to interact with with people, with general public and with governments to help you make it as useful as we can. Thank you. Uh, Idenori, you already spoke uh, about the uh, legal process in, in Japan. Uh, how is organized a societal debate uh, in Japan oh. and how the government uh, is informed of the societal views? Yes, uh, that's very important issue in also in in Japan. Um, so uh, the education and the social engagement and the social dialogue are very important. We know, but uh, uh, how we still considering uh, how it is best way or what we. Uh, the con what we connect to the social or the young people and uh, the ordinary people that's very Im uh, important issues so um and uh, we i think also the, the uh, science itself is very important that for gene Editing itself, technology is advancing. We know. Be, however, the, we do not have uh, much knowledge about human pre-implantation embryo development, especially in molecular level. So we we do not have uh, enough knowledge about the simply uh, human embryo development. So uh, that's why we have to uh, proceed the basic science level, human pre-implantation embryo. So that's why the scientist or science itself need uh, transparency for the outside, the society. And then we, uh, we need uh, some, the 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 discussion freely or also social dialogue at this point also we we had questions in the in the audience about this <coughs> transparency <coughs> sorry this transparency and this uh, visibility uh, for example we have one question about the mili military use or do your use of genome editing um, so People are, are concerned not only about safety, but also about knowing what kind of, uh, of field, in addition to uh, health, uh, is, um, is uh, involved in genome editing. Francoise, um, the, 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 this question of equal access is also linked to the question of societal debate to decide what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, techniques will go through uh, what kind of access? Absolutely. Um, and in the sort of time frame between 2015, 
when we had sort of the first publication of the genetic manipulation of the human embryo and where we are today, much has happened, including the birth of genetically modified children. And one of the things that I think is really important is to understand that a rich conversation has been happening, but it happens in sort of, if you will, sequestered clusters. And that's because we haven't yet figured out how to use technology for the benefit of really, I think, in-depth, meaningful engagement. Um, in that context, for those who are interested, um, I have published a book in this area called Altered Inheritance, CRISPR and the Ethics of Human Genome Editing. And in there, I look specifically at the ways in which members of the scientific community, and I understand that broadly, can meaningfully contribute to uh, public dialogue partly by providing information in a way that's accessible, uh, but also partly at times uh, playing a role of advocate and advocating for different perspectives. And then I also talk about the role of the arbiter, uh, where you actually try to bring forward information in a way that you are ultimately not advocating for a very specific perspective, but really trying to elevate the discussion. And you might think about some of that that's happened with scientists, for example, participating in discussions and debate around uh, climate challenges. Um, and beyond looking at the role of the scientific community, I have a whole other section where I look at the role of the ethics community and the ways in which people with certain kinds of knowledge and expertise need to be committed to sharing that. But the challenge is, we actually haven't figured out how to have uh, conversations yet, if you will, on a global scale. And so the, although there's a lot of enthusiasm for ongoing dialogue with different constituencies, those constituencies unfortunately stay clustered, um, partly because of comfort level, partly because of um, the ways in which we've understood who our peers are. So if I can, I often use as the metaphor, um, the kitchen table. What would it be like to think about having conversations like, should we proceed with human genome editing as a topic that you would have as dinner conversation where anybody can participate because we all need to sit around the table and eat at some point as contrasted with thinking that those conversations belong in the lab. Well, only certain people go into the lab or thinking that those conversations belong around the business tables where industry is making decisions. Well, again, only certain people get to be part of those conversations. You can imagine a government table. And so it's really about thinking, how can we expand the spaces in which these conversations happen? And how can we think about the ways in which we can make people welcome? And I will say that very often I hear, well, we've invited them to come to these meetings and they don't come. And it's like saying, well, maybe you need to think about why they wouldn't come. Lots of people don't come if they don't feel that they're genuinely welcome. And so I think that's where the metaphors can do some work for us in thinking through how do we find spaces? And I think honestly, we haven't spent enough money on the technology of understanding how humans make decisions, how humans interact, how humans prioritize their ethical values when there are challenges. And yet we're spending millions upon millions on the, on the basic science. And so I really am actually making a call for thinking about the social sciences and humanities as actually equally important in moving forward this agenda if, if we really are deeply committed to equal access. So we have to walk that talk. Um, I was, uh, I was my, uh, thank you, Francoise, and I was smiling because, uh, uh, as you know, I'm a neuroscientist and uh, in my lab, uh, many experiments are done on decision-making processes, uh, obviously uh, on animal, but also on humans. So thank you. I know for you the didn't million. pay me to, to argue <laughs> thank, for more money. For thank you for the I'll million. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, dear friends, uh, sorry, Lee, we arrive at the end of our roundtable. Uh, do you have any extra comment, Idenori or Marta, that, Martina, that you want to make before I try to uh, wrap up uh, very rapidly the end of this roundtable? From my part, uh, thank you again. This, I think these kind of, of roundtables and debates are very rich. Uh, I like very much the words of, 
of Francoise. Uh, it's incredible how another perspective can open your mind and, and start. you start thinking, okay, I will try to go the other way because uh, I'm always on the lab and making my science, but there, there is uh, many other things that have to be taken into account. So congratulate you for for this. I hope for the for the public uh, it is worthy, and we can answer the questions maybe later. I don't know where, but I, I can see there is a lot of questions that we didn't have the time to to answer, and it's interesting to to have trust, the time. Uh, trust UNESCO and trust the uh, ethics uh, section of UNESCO uh, to be able to uh, hear to all the questions. And uh, I say that also for the public, if you have uh, any additional questions, just feel free uh, to send them to us and uh, yeah. our ethics committees, uh, Comest and IBC, and uh, our colleagues will receive these questions. Uh, Idenori, you want yep. uh, some, yes. some yes. La uh, last comment? Yeah, last comment. So it, and, uh, uh, we had a I had a very, very uh, good uh, opportunity so to uh, have some discussion with uh, Francoise and Martina and them. Um, so I also, I think uh, now not only one country, single country, the global discussion is very important. And also regional discussion also I think important. So uh, I think next step uh, in uh, our own country, not only our own country, and then um, regional discussion maybe uh, would be uh, very fruitful for us. And then next, the global step. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you the, for, for the all three of this uh, incredible discussion. Um, pour, uh, pour essayer de résumer ou en tirer quelques conclusions, euh, il serait extrêmement prétentieux de ma part, après vos très riches interventions, euh, d'arriver à dire quelque chose qui, en trois phrases, capture l'entièreté des choses. Mais ce qu'on constate, c'est que nous sommes dans un processus de construction. Et nous sommes dans un processus de construction où les connaissances scientifiques et l'avancement des connaissances scientifiques sont absolument nécessaires, mais pas suffisants. Où nous devons euh, arriver à avoir un engagement de la société euh, pour discuter les champs d'application, les moyens à mettre, et pour discuter de ce principe fondamental de l'égalité euh, d'accès euh, aux bénéfices de la technologie. Nous avons vu dans la table ronde les différents champs d'application de l'édition du génome et nous voyons que, bien sûr, la sécurité est à chaque fois mise en avant, mais pas seulement la sécurité. Nous ne pouvons pas tolérer l'injustice et nous l'avons vu. Nous avons pris beaucoup de positions au niveau du comité international de bioéthique de l'UNESCO et de la COMEST. Nous avons vu au cours de la crise du covid les ravages de l'inégalité, l'inégalité d'accès à l'information, l'inégalité de la capacité à prendre des mesures barrières pour les plus vulnérables, l'inégalité d'accès aux vaccins. Et nous avons découvert à cette occasion, découvert s'il en était nécessaire, que la découverte scientifique ne suffit pas. Les vaccins à ARN ont été disponibles dès l'automne, la fin de l'automne 2020, et on nous parle d'une vaccination pour l'Afrique à la fin de l'année 2023. Ceci nous montre le besoin colossal d'infrastructures. Et quand nous parlons d'infrastructures, il s'agit bien entendu de lieux de production pour les différents traitements, mais aussi d'une infrastructure de distribution, de logistique, et donc finalement d'une infrastructure de gouvernance. Et nous voyons qu'il est impossible de dissocier l'accès et l'égalité d'accès d'une bonne gouvernance de ces questions. Et ce que nous voyons aujourd'hui pour le Covid, ce que nous verrons demain pour l'édition du génome, sera encore plus important pour le changement climatique, euh, 
Nous avons donc à prendre à bras le corps cette question de l'implémentation du développement de la mise en place de la gouvernance. Merci d'avoir participé à cette table ronde qui conclut ce cycle de quatre tables rondes dédiées à l'édition du génome. Et pour les mots de conclusion, je cède la parole à notre directrice générale pour les sciences humaines de l'UNESCO, Gabriela Ramos. Gabriela, a few words to close, close uh, this round table and the circle of five, four round tables. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hervé, and thank you to Francoise, to Idenori, and to, and to uh, Martina. This has been a, a fantastic uh, um, exchange. Uh, showing the complexities of the issues that are really related to how to ensure that technological progress is uh, not only pertinent, but also fair, inclusive, and that is not only the domain of the scientific research, as, uh, as uh, Hervé has mentioned. Um, I, I don't come from the world of the genome, but every time I listen to you, the real um, question is how do we in the governments and the international institutions that have this important mandate to ensure that scientific progress is uh, uh, delivering for people and for the challenges that we face in an inclusive manner. The real challenge is how do we create the incentives for the magnificent progress that is being made? And each one of you mentioned some of the applications of these uh, techniques uh, in very concrete and, and meaningful areas uh, to improve the well-being of people, how do we ensure that the incentives are there for, for technological progress that is being made in the laboratories or in the industry to ensure that they have this societal view uh, to, 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 to benefit everybody? Uh, I, can, I can join you in, in, uh, in this commitment because it's UNESCO is about that. You have seen it with Herbe. Herbe continues to be part of our committees, uh, the Ethics of, uh, of uh, Science and the International Bioethics Committee. Uh, but we will continue striving for that because the fact is that when science is not uh, shared uh, fairly across the world, uh, we are seeing the backlash, as Herbe mentioned, with the vaccine distribution. And it's almost self-defeating prophecy because we knew that if we didn't uh, go through everyone around the world, uh, we would have more waves and waves, and this is exactly where we are uh, living now. We were proud to be one of the first institutions with our international uh, ethics committees to say we need to consider the vaccine as a global public good, uh, but it seems that we are uh, prophets in the desert <laughs> because we're still, uh, we're still uh, facing the sixth wave of the pandemic. So in any case, I think that we need to continue uh, gathering this evidence, this research, these very important insights that you have uh, provided us. But, but it's also true that this is the, the round table that closes this uh, set of discussions with the very same frame, framing, but, but with very different uh, content. Um, I am I'm really grateful to all of your interventions. I'm really grateful to the, to the government of Japan again uh, we hope that these kind of exchanges, uh, as we say, in a multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary, uh, multicultural, diverse way can continue and that you will all feel part of this uh, UNESCO network of experts that are all joined uh, by the very strong desire to make this uh, a much uh, fairer, fairer world. So thank you so much. Thank you for all the, the participants. I see that it has been a very large group of, uh, of uh, attendees. As Serbe said, uh, our, our um, section on uh, bioethics will be looking at the questions, but you can always visit our um, uh, site on the social and human science uh, sector of UNESCO in uh, www.unesco.org. And you will find a lot of uh, resources and we will be putting uh, the results of this uh, round table also in the, in the net. So thank you so much. This is just the continuation of a very good uh, discussion and a continuation of our efforts in these mm -hmm. domains.